All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Empire and Bell Curve. If you are, uh, we got a special little crossover up today, crossover roundup. If you're listening on Empire, we are joined by our friend at uh, Framework Ventures, Michael. And if you are listening on Bell Curve, Vance and Mippo are both in Paris. So we got Santi joining us for this one. Welcome to the, to the crossover, gents. Great to be Hi. here. Great to be here, man. We got the we got the black hoodie gang. <laughs> Mine's yeah. technically blue, but sure. <laughs> Sunday, I feel like you, you don't like when I ever call your hoodies black. Like, I, I just I just don't wear black, <laughs> dude. I, I I don't. I'm not like the Steve Jobs kind of bullshit thing. No, but listen. <laughs> speaking about hoodies, there's been a lot of hoodie activity in the punk realm. Dude, punks like punk OTC <laughs> bought like five hoodies and then resold them, and some of them have been uh, selling for like. Uh, you know, one of them sold for like the lowest, I think, in, in a while. But there's been a lot of hoodie uh, trades uh, recently, going back to that episode we recorded on punks. Santi, do you know that? Um, so we recorded, like, we, we've been talking about punks a lot on Empire. And uh, after those big trades happened, I got like five different messages being like, this you, this you. Huh. I was like, I'm, <laughs> I'm so glad that you guys, the listeners, think that I have half a million dollars to go spend on a punk. I really, I really do appreciate that. But uh it even oh, wow. like sounds exactly the kind of thing that someone who did buy would say. So this right. might just exactly. be pure psyops. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not buying that. But sure, it's not you. Um, right. Yeah. Exactly. Punks ripping though. Um, you guys have any ECC FOMO? Seems like a pretty good event. Been hearing reports that it has been a lot of fun. Uh, I I was on vacation the last two weeks, so Vance decided to uh, go uh, to represent Framework, and uh, yeah, it's it's only been good things so far from what I've heard from them about the conference itself. I think the other thing that is definitely the case is it seems like you know this is the year uh, or this is the time of the year when everybody just comes out with their big announcements. You know, all of all the blue chips are are coming out with you know major changes, updates, new products. Um, Kind of reminds me of like what happens with WWDC with Apple, where it's like, oh, you wait till early June, and that's when you see what they're working on, and then it comes out later in the year. And it feels like that type of cadence is, you know, three years going at this point, maybe even four. Um, ECC kind of be, becomes that announcement platform um, for everybody who has been working on really cool stuff for the last, you know, six, 12 months. Yeah. I think that's the way that the industry is going to progress, by the way. I'm reading this um, book called. I think it's just called Build by Tony Fidel, the guy who built Nest and the iPhone yep. and, and mm -hmm. the iPod. iPod. And yep. he talks about um, basically product cadences and like new industries and, and in new companies that you just kind of ship things. You just kind of push things out the door. But that that eventually becomes too exhausting for your company and actually eventually too exhausting for your customers. So where I think the industry is going is like what we're starting to see develop is these basically like ebbs and flows of product releases and everyone kind of getting on the same page. Um, about when about when things will get released. So I have a feeling you will see like maybe, t and I think they'll be probably centered around big conferences. I think probably two or three times a year, you'll see like big product announcements around ECC, permissionless. And then I would assume uh, individual companies as they get bigger, start hosting their own events. Like, you know, Salesforce has theirs, Apple has theirs, HubSpot has theirs, those kind of things. So, yeah, it's a good call out. I feel like there's been a couple of big trends that have come out of ECC. Um, Account abstraction, right? Vitalik had a big talk on account abstraction. He kind of, I don't, I don't know if you guys watched it or saw any highlights or talked to Vance yeah. at all, but it, I mean, he kind of very clearly sees a future where all crypto users migrate from these externally owned account wallets to these smart contract based wallets. Um, and, to, and he talked about two things. He said, um, uh, bad wallet and interoperability UX are the two major factors holding crypto from gaining more adoption. Um, and that, crypto wallet verticalization is long overdue and is very welcomed and that I think his his like closing line or something uh, near the end of the speech was that wallet evolution can be called a success when managing a wallet becomes as easy as using an email account. I thought that was a good kind of like north star for us to be working towards. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the UX is only going to improve with the kind of abstraction and I think that's when well, we've talked about this ad nauseum on Bell Curve and I'm sure on Empire but that's been one of the biggest uh, elements of this industry that we've been holding ourselves back with. I think it's actually served us well in a lot of reason you know, for a lot of reasons. But as we move to scale, as we move to get to be table stakes feature parity with CFI, that's going to be something that has to change. And, and you know, we can talk about it as well. But it, it does actually dovetail nicely into 
you know, what the synthetic team and Kane announced with Infinex, which is literally a off-chain sign-up email password. We created we created an account on the back end. You fund it. You don't ever have to really interact with it. But uh, I, I think we're moving in that direction, not just on the protocol level, but also on the application level too. Yeah, that's funny because Kane called me and said, "Hey, listen, like I'm really tired of of." There's very few users like DeFi in and of itself. I know it's been like two two years of plus of bear market and rightfully so. I mean, the criticism is like, like there's very few users. There's just a number of power users. But um, I think uh, Kane has always been at the forefront. He's always ahead six months to a year. And he's, he's just whenever he calls and he's been sort of in a hiatus and came back and said, hey, listen, I think I think now is the time to focus on UX to your point, Michael, like. I think like if you were to focus, like if account abstraction came like, I don't know, two years ago, I don't think it would have been as impactful, difficult to say, but I just feel like there's a time to invest in infrastructure. And I think now we sort of are, if you think about probably infrastructure is, can support so many more users and activity. Um, and so I think now is really the time to focus on, on front facing kind of, you know, consumer applications, uh, which will come, you know. We've talked a lot on Empire, I'm sure, Bell Curve, like gaming and NFTs and and DeFi. I mean, just stable coins are a, a uh, are the killer product of, of of crypto. Yeah, it's cool to see Kane and Synthetics kind of lead, leading the way for this next potential DeFi bull market. It's cool to uh, it's cool to see it. Yeah, Infinex is cool. So my understanding of Infinex, maybe Michael, you can fill us in a little more, is that um, because there are a couple of big protocol announcements that I want to talk about. So there's uh, Synthetics announced Infinex. Uh, Uniswap announced Uniswap X. Um, Chainlink announced CCIP. So maybe we can run, run through all of those real quick. So uh, on Friday, Synth- uh, Synthetics announced Infinex, which is basically my understanding is it's uh, a derivatives front end to Synthetics. So Synthetics has this kind of on-chain trading infrastructure. Um, it's a protocol for for on-chain trading. They are putting a uh, like a centralized ex- or a new exchange that aims to take on centralized exchanges. On the front end, it's a very, very, very easy to use, like optimized for the UX and the UI and the user. Um, sign up with an email and a password, and that's just the front end, but it leverages Synthetics, uh, the trading protocol on the back end. Uh, I think it's governed by this uh, by SNX, which is the native token of Synthetics. Um, platforms revenues are used to accumulate back to the token. That, that's kind of my understanding, but would love to hear your thoughts on like big deal, not a big deal, thoughts on Infinex. So, <clears throat> yeah, one, one caveat I would say is the the way the current system for synthetics works is what I would call like in what they call the V2X state, which is you have all of the things that were existing in the last year, year and a half, two years. But I'd say what what Infinex and, and frankly, like what is um, required for launching Infinex is the move towards V3, which is more about creating new markets and new forms of liquidity um, new ecosystems to trade. And so it's more of, it, it's going to start off as semi-permissioned, eventually move to permissionless. But if you have an, a new idea for a financial product, if you have a, a new idea for you know a trading apparatus <clears throat> or a mechanism uh, like that, uh, that's really what the new protocol upgrades within V3, which some of which are already on mainnet. I think the rest of it is supposed to come out by the end of the year. Um, and then Infinex, to your point, you know, is, is really just a, a consumer friendly way of accessing those markets that doesn't require you to really be a DeFi native and trust, you know, having all of your assets either in a hardware wallet, on MetaMask, and you know, going through the the rig and roll that we've all uh, become accustomed to over the last few years. It, it is really an effort to bring in new users to DeFi. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, to your point, <laughs> Kane is always ahead. Um, and uh, really smart and and calculated about when the right time is to do that. Um, I think you know recognizing that the infrastructure is frankly ready. Um, we have a lot of the the tools in place to be able to accomplish the the growth and scalability that we think we all um, should be having in DeFi right now. The UX has been you know holding things back. The other thing I think that Infinex recognizes is that it's not just going to be happening on optimism where you know all trading activity is currently happening with with synthetics the protocol it can happen across chain and that's a huge element as well where you don't have to just be relying on the liquidity that exists in a certain ecosystem right now you you could be trading on avalanche or arbitrum or optimism eventually and and i think you know infinex would also be an abstraction layer on top of that too that's great that's really cool 
the my favorite part of this is that I feel like every, we're at 18 months into the bear market, everyone right now is so focused on infrastructure. And I think that was one of the main themes at ECC, like building kind of flat infrastructure. Nobody's focused on consumer products. Nobody's focused on the front end. And Kane just comes out and is like, look, the infrastructure is here. Let's stop. Let's stop focusing so much on the infrastructure. It's time to build better front ends. So I love the contrarian take here. Kind of dovetails into Uniswap. So Unis- I don't know if you guys were following Uniswap uh, revealed Uniswap X. Did you guys see this? Yep. So uh, my I think the high level takeaway is so Uniswap revealed Uniswap X, which is this permissionless open source auction based protocol for trading across AMMs and other liquidity sources. Um, so my, my understanding is it's an aggregator that outsources routing to this kind of open network of competing fillers that fill the swaps at the best prices through Dutch auction Dutch auctions. And um, I think this, so my understanding, like getting into the details a little is like the swaps are gas free from a user's perspective uh, because the swappers are actually signing off chain orders, not on chain. The fillers then submit them on chain. And to finalize the transactions, the fillers cover the gas fees. Um, I think right now it's opt in beta. And then later this year, this cross chain update will be launched, which combines swapping and bridging into one auction. Feels like a. It feels like this is Uniswap going kind of the opposite route of Kane. Kane is saying like we need to have synthetic, start focusing on the front end, start focusing on the user experience. Uniswap is here saying, look, everyone knows Uniswap for the for the front end experience. We need to start becoming like this kind of base layer infrastructure for building AMMs on top of. I'm curious what you think of that. I mean, my, my quick take is I think it's actually very similar. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it goes back to what we were talking about with account, account abstraction, where uh, account abstraction really enables so that the end user is not the one who has to like think about, okay, what's the price of ETH? Am I going to wait for gas prices to go down? You know, have to play that game. And, and really, they can just put an order out on chain. They can specify how long they want the Dutch auction to run. I think it's like something from 10 blocks to 10 days. Um, so you really have a long period of time where like these orders are live and and can get filled by a filler. I think it also just invites a new opportunity for a new player in this ecosystem, which is a filler. And you know, it, yeah. historically in traditional financial markets, like that, that is how most of the volume for retail flow actually gets filled. And and I think I, I think if you can aggregate liquidity on that side and and get some real serious players involved. Like this, this could be you know the new place that spot markets are transacting in in a very serious way, but I think it, it goes back to the same principles of we need to optimize for growth. This is going to make it a lot easier for people who aren't necessarily Uniswap customers already to be able to interact with Uniswap or any of the different Uniswap pools. It, it will eventually become cross chain in the same recognition that we can't just rely on one single ecosystem for all of our liquidity, uh, and maybe people want to be transacting in different places. So I, I think. You know, from a principles basis, it's it's very similar. Um, it definitely is promoting and entrenching a lot of the Uniswap specific protocols. Um, <clears throat> but in the same way that Uniswap has a lot of the the spot liquidity, I think you know Infinex is going to be going after a lot of the perps liquidity. Um, and and so they they kind of are a lot of the same in in my mind. At least that was my read. Interesting. That's a really good point. Yeah, I guess what you're getting here is you're seeing two DeFi protocols. Go try to really compete with with centralized exchanges in this next market. Like I guess what you're building with Uniswap X here is you have access to tokens from a bunch of different chains. You have no gas fees. Much simpler UX than a lot of like. Remember signing up for just centralized exchanges? You have to send <laughs> send you know, a picture of yourself, send in the license. Like it's like a 15 step process. So you've got like much simpler UX than these kind of old school crypto exchanges. And then um, I think my understanding too is like. For non-fiat fiat transactions, there's you, you don't need to do uh, KYC AML, so it's much quicker onboarding, right? So if you combine those things, like access to tokens from a bunch of different chains, no gas fees, simpler UX, quicker onboarding, then you've got what Synthetics is building, Kane's building. You got two pretty damn good uh, decentralized exchanges that are going to, I think, go head to head with these centralized exchanges in the next market. Yeah, and I, I I think that that was also the like the explicit goal too. Like I know Kane said that. I, I I'm pretty sure I, I heard Hayden say that as well. But like once again, um, we've seen everything that has happened in the last 12 months from a centralized entity perspective in crypto, and I think this is a recognition that it's time, and we now have the tools to be able to have DeFi, you know, take up the the reins and run with it. Yeah, you know, it's. Um- 
we discussed this uh, so yesterday. I recorded a podcast with Rebecca and Jake, um, a regulatory pod, and of course, the the the, the key word here now is programmatic, right? Uh, on the Ripple case specifically, of course, it talks nothing about DeFi. And my question to them was, hey, what about DEXs? Like, is that a programmatic sale? Because in my mind, I mean, you, yeah, like it, it's uh, it's even actually more. I would think that it would fit that criteria, but of course. They were like, well, we don't know, right? And so I think, uh, of course, there's still pending regulation to clarify that stuff. But but imagine a world where it is. You could see a lot of flow. I mean, like, I still remember in the early days of DeFi, there were so many people that were skeptical of this AMM model. Because if you come from traditional finance, right, everyone was like, this is not going to work. I mean, order books are just better, right? And I think DeFi, um, the smartest people in DeFi, you know, Kane, Hayden, even Vitalik, and a bunch of folks, like, it requires a, a a new level of thinking of what these new tools allow for um, not just copying it, like, you know, exactly what is traditional finance, but innovating and creating kind of, you know, flat, think about flash phones, think about like AMMs and the consumer preference that you know, everyone could be a market maker. What I'm trying to say with all this is it was pretty shocking. I think a lot of the skeptics really got behind the idea of DeFi when they saw how efficient and uh, cost effective it was to trade stable coins in a protocol like Curve because it was cheaper and it still is than going through a traditional centralized exchange. So like, I just like to remind listeners that like DeFi is highly efficient, which is a lot of times like there's a critical point of, of crypto, which is anytime you try to decentralize stuff, you lose efficiency and, you know, centralized parties are just better. The reality is like, no, and you minimize counterparty risk. So I, I think like DeFi is um, of course, there's been like now chatter over the last kind of month month or so that has been percolating around like the resurgence of DeFi and people talking about real world assets and maker. Um, but I think DeFi is 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 kind of forgotten. And I think it will really catch people off guard when they see how a nice UX plug in into all the kind of the pipes that are already there and super battle tested and how quickly it will gain traction. Um, so I'm pretty excited about uh Kane building in this direction. Yeah. 100% agree. Yeah, yeah agreed. Michael, you want to give us the overview on Chainlink uh, CCIP? <laughs> before, I, before I say this, I, I got to yeah. say, like, my first, uh, when I first learned about uh, framework, it was um, I, I, someone described, like, yeah, these, these guys are like deep in Chainlink. Uh, and of course, like, Chainlink was like doing all these announcements to Google and it was like ripping the chain. Like, the Link Marines were like, Link Marines, on the Twitter. yeah. So that was my first, um, that was my first interaction with framework. And then I learned that they were like super deep in synthetics as well. So, anyways, just for, for people that might not appreciate Michael's perspective on chain, like none of this is legal financial advice, but you know, yeah, no, this is uh this is someone that has been deep in chain link for a while. Michael, do you have a, uh, a link Marines like Anon account? Are you like one of the big, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been accused of that many times. Um, but no, I, I'm not, um, <clears throat> again, something yeah. that if you were a true link, you were, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Vance and I, uh, got to know the link team actually like six years ago, it was like summer of 2017, um, and we it, like participated in the ecosystem basically before, uh, two years before we started, uh, framework even. Um, and so, yeah, chain link is something that we've been following for, you know, the better part of a decade at this point, I would say the in, insanely incredible thing that, um, Sergey has been able to do is he's been able to stick to the same exact thesis. Uh, of where the industry is moving for that entire period of time. And even before so, I mean, he he was a, a part of a, a smart contract platform and, and company prior to Chainlink. Um, and it's it's more of this change, like there's been new products, um, but, but the thesis has remained the exact same, which is really kind of what I would say CCIP embodies, which is the internet of smart contracts and the uh, enablement of creating these communications protocols uh, or, or a unifying uh, communications protocol that connects everything, I think is the representation of of where this industry is going. We've talked about it from an infinite infinite perspective. We talked about it from um, a Uniswap X perspective, but you know, cross chain is something that I think is just inevitable at this point. In the last couple of years, we've talked. We, you know, there were 
put, there were a lot of efforts, and and I think Kane would even admit this to basically have everybody build on optimism, or everybody build on Arbitrum, or everybody build on whatever it may be. Um, and I think that what we're starting to see is the need to be able to have the complete trust and and verifiability to be able to move assets across platform because there's just inherently going to be that. Um, in the same way that we saw with the internet too, it's not like one operating system or one ecosystem was the dominant and end all winner. Um, you have to be able to have um, you know the the interactability between different applications across platforms. So. CCIP has been worked on for, I, I don't even know how many years at this point, maybe two or three. Um, it's been a long time coming, but um, it really does, uh, I think, reinvigorate a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, which is improvements in UX, the cross-chain portability of liquidity, cross-chain functionality. Um, and there already are a number of cross-chain communications protocols and um, ones that are working and scaling right now. And I think it's going to be an interesting question as to see like what are the differentiating factors what are the technical specifications you know which one's better in, in those respects because i think ultimately that wins but also who gets the most distribution and who's going to be able to plug in um to be that cross-chain transport layer um but chainlink is starting off with a huge list of existing partners um and so being able to have this on mainnet i think is a huge thing it, it really um it it definitely does breathe a lot more air into the sales of Chainlink, which I'd say over the last year has been sort of a question as to when. It's always been a question of when is this coming? Two weeks TM, um, but it is it is really fun to see it live. Um, and yeah, hats off to the team for a huge accomplishment. Yeah, and yeah, Michael, for like someone who may not really appreciate the nuance here, like what does this kind of enable or empower? Right, because you have all the we talk a lot about. There's multiple L ones, there's multiple L twos, and so. What is this kind of chain link fabric, connectivity fabric, like enable that is not possible today? Yeah, so I, I think, um, well, one of the things that it hopefully gets rid of uh, in a lot of ways is bridging. And uh, bridges, uh, as anybody in the industry knows, have been one of the biggest honey pots for hacks or losses of assets and funds. Um, so hopefully this is a, a mitigant towards moving in uh, just a better technical direction um, where instead of having a bridge facilitate assets where you send it to the bridge, you verify that the assets are there and then you mint basically a placeholder asset on another platform um, where the original asset actually stays on the previous platform, it, that model actually changes where you can have native minting and burning on both chains. That is just a, a much better uh, technical model. And, and what is required is you have to have this abstraction layer above both of those platforms or below, depending on how you think of the, the stack, um, which facilitates the native actions on both of those chains and has the trusted verifiability and, and um, mandate to do it. Um, so all of that, I'd say, is probably the biggest thing. But from a UX perspective, what this could mean is um, you know, as we're talking about in the case of like Uniswap X, for instance, where I don't, I don't know if they're going to use CCIP, but you can imagine the concept where somebody's making a swap on one end, they put assets up in this, uh, you know, format where the order exists on, let's say, you know, optimism, but the actual person who's filling it lives on Arbitrum. And instead of actually having someone have to send assets across to be able to fill the order, you would have the verifiability of the assets on one chain which then would release the assets on the other chain. And only when the order is filled on the previous chain would you release them on the other chain. And so all of the messaging that is required to be able to facilitate that like multi-step transaction would be facilitated by something like this. So I, I think that's probably the best example. And of course, we talk about like trust assumptions that you're making when you're using a bridge um, or even an L2. In this case, you there is a, trust being placed in in Chainlink and their ecosystem of partners that has been pretty battle tested at this point but maybe if you could just yep. touch on on the on the trust assumptions that you're making while using this yeah so i think there's implicit trust in just what you said sante with you know chainlink has been you know the dominant oracle provider and uh, backstopping, I don't know how many billions of TVL at this point, but mm -hmm. you know the the Oracle solution to be able to enable that. I'd say there's also a direct um, uh, oh. trust assumption in that anyone who's facilitating these transactions, and and I don't know exactly, I, I don't think they've gone totally into the token model yet, but there is an implicit stake 
that you have to put up to be someone who's facilitating these transactions and therefore earning the fees for facilitating the transactions. And, and so, you know, to have the transactions, it's not like these are just free messages that are being passed. You have to pay a fee either in the form of link or another asset to the, to the, the um, operator who is facilitating the transactions. But then that operator also has to have some stake to be able to know that if they were you know, found out to be malicious or, or made a mistake, for instance, there is a potential slashing. Yeah. Um, and so in the same way that Ethereum has the you know, slashing elements for validator nodes, you know, this is the same thing. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. We go always back to synthetics because uh, synthetics uh, was one of the first to really adopt Chainlink. And I think at one point was the number one U fee payer or was subsidized, but it was, yep. it was pretty much like really in the early days of DeFi, um, Kane, I still remember we were having dinner and he said, listen, you need a Switzerland. You need like a, a, a cause they were like, they had like a pretty adversarial, there was a, there was an incident where like the Korean peg just went out of whack and like, they're like, we just four, need $4 trillion was minted or something <laughs> yeah. like that. And, and it was interesting to me, that was the first, you know, cause of course Chainlink had done all these announcements of like with Google and a, a bunch of like created a really nice ecosystem, but like you're in the midst of a bear market and you're tired of announcements. You're like, I, you know, yeah. whatever, you know, but that was for me the first time that I realized, okay, there is definitely a need to have an independent third party that is, that is the Oracle here. Um, and and synthetics really was kind of the first protocol and, and the experience that they had to go through of realizing that that the hard way to me it was pretty insightful. So anyways, all this to say is uh, synthetics has just been one of those protocols. It's been through the fire and just back and tested a lot of these solutions. Like it was pretty impressive to see like how they really engineer token economic. I mean, this is not a shell of synthetics in any way, shape or form, but I was just super close to them as well. And so it was, they really, a lot of people credit like, DeFi summer to compound and certainly like it triggered like yield farming, but a lot of those elements were borrowed from synthetics like token economics and staking. And then you had, um, you know, the obviously chain link and then, uh, you know, uh, yeah, just synthetics optimism. I mean, they've, you know, as it relates to public goods, I mean, they were just instrumental in like layer twos because it was so expensive to interact and claim at SNX on a weekly basis. So it's, it's pretty fascinating to see how, different protocols contribute back to the ecosystem. Yep. And funny enough, I actually met Kane for the first time at a Chainlink and Friends dinner at the Web3 Summit in Berlin. There you go. Um, so, you know, it, it's all it's all part of the same family. Yeah. Yeah. Santi, so, you're an investor in Layer Zero as well. Is it fair to say that there's this like kind of CCIP versus Layer Zero? Like, is that the kind of big like Layer Zero or, you know, uh, cross-chain battle that we're going to see play out over the next couple of, you know, in the same way that maybe Arbitrum and Optimism are battling or, you know, 2021, it was our, uh, Avalanche for Solana. Is that kind of like the new thing that we're going to see develop is maybe layer zero versus chain link CCP IP? Uh, it certainly feels that way. Uh, like how directly competitive or complementary, like I'm still processing, like trying to learn about what chain link, but, but yeah, like when I first learned about chain link, it's like, yeah, I mean, this is what layer zero is attempting to do. Is there a place for having multiple messaging services? You could argue maybe, maybe not. I mean, there's one standard really. And if you look at the Web2 stack, like there's really kind of one one standard as HTTP, like HTTPS or some of these. So I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting question. Like Michael or Yano, I don't know if you guys have a strong view on, but um, like you know, if you have multiple messaging providers, like does that create confusion or is there some sort of standard that the industry needs to align with? And how do these two say in a world where you have layer zero and chain link, like, you know, at the end of the day, whoever the user is, is not going to care. I think you just kind of use the one that is the safest, the most efficient, the most reliable. So yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Too early to tell in my mind, but I'd be curious, Michael, if you have a strong view on it. Definitely too early to tell as well. Um, <clears throat> there already are a number of others, um, even in addition to Layer Zero and, and Chainlink. So it's it's you know it does seem like those are the two biggest at this point. Um, I think Layer Zero has come out and said that um, you will have to use ZRO or, or Z, whatever the the token is as a form of payment, um, which architecturally is the same as CCIP. Um, 
So it feels like it, to um, Santi's point, maybe there's a world where everybody has to maintain, you know, some ZRO and some link tokens to be able to facilitate payments on behalf of these transactions. Um, maybe there's some easy way of making that happen. I think then there's also the question of like, how easy is it to integrate into these messaging protocols? And um, is it possible to maintain those integrations for multiple if you need to? Um, so all of these are big open-ended questions and, and definitely agree it's, it's way too early to tell. I mean, regardless, I mean, these two attempts are a, a step in the right direction because the current architecture of bridges is just is a bit broken. I think we've seen that just in practice. Um, there have been different flavors of bridges, like both you guys and I'm an investor in a number of bridges. Like it's worth trying these things, but ultimately I think the more elegant solution is something like CCIP or what layer zero is trying to do. Um, so, you know, I think we're moving the right direction and competition is, is just That's the good. nature of the game here. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all, all we're seeing here is just these, like, we're just abstract, abstracting the networks away from the user level. So either whether you're using layer zero or CCIP, it's at the end of the day, it's better for the user. So, um, Santi, you, uh, you recorded a policy episode, policy and regulation episode this week with Jake and Rebecca that you mentioned earlier. I, I wasn't able to join you, but I saw, I saw that we put that live on Thursday. Are, um, any, any highlights, takeaways from that, that we missed last week when we were talking about, you know, things like the Ripple case and other stuff. Any any unique takeaways there? I'll spend like 30 seconds to a minute. I think the biggest one was Jake was very much in the camp of like, you know, this case, like Ripple is not a security. Now, and I think historically he said tokens are not, like his point is very strong around tokens are not securities. The manner in which you sell them can have implications, but like the token itself is not a security. And that has very strong implications around something like like the, the Coinbase case, right? Because they've been strong around this idea that we're not listing securities. Uh, and I think he agreed and both Rebecca and Jake agreed, the biggest winner here are exchanges. Someone like Coinbase, because you know they're clearly the, the court uh, was ruling very positively in the nature of those transactions. Um, so, so yeah, both of them said, look, this might be the most important piece of like, like just ruling that we've had since they both joined the industry, which is really encouraging to hear candidly. Um, and so both of them seem to think that there might be some penalty that Ripple at some point is pays for. Because I told them, look, the biggest questions in my mind that I wanted to get their perspective on is, so what does this mean for the rest of the industry? Like, because there is a nature by which you know, I explain, as both of you guys know, but I'll just explain it quickly. There's usually a, a equity round that has some warrant attached to if there's ever a token event. And that sequence and like model has been pretty much the standard coming out of the two, 2018 ICO boom. Like we all kind of moved in the direction of having like a safe plus warrants. And then at some point there's a token generation event. Some of the investors and the, and the company gets tokens and there's airdrops and the community gets some stuff. Um, and so the, the biggest point here is uh, both of them said, look, it's just the programmatic nature of it uh, certainly feels like for companies that are going to, for token issuers today and down the road, going through exchanges is, is going to be, you're going to see more of that. And there will be just, of course, there's like nuance around like for the investor piece, right? If you're an investor in the company, you get tokens. The key here is on a case by case basis. Of course, do you have lockups? Do you have like what is normally what traditionally like uh, if if you're like an investor in the company IPOs, like you have a like, year lockup of sorts, you know. And so these things are important. So, anyways, th those were like the biggest um, points that we touched on. I would encourage people to go listen to that. And um, but yeah, in summary, both of them felt really bullish, of course, in 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 this type of ruling. And then we touched on like the what is it, the McKendry Thompson bill and the legis the stablecoin bill, both of which are, there's going to be markups on both coming up. So that will be interesting to see. And um, so, yeah, a lot going on. I feel like this is like the, the golden age for uh, lawyers in crypto. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's always been pretty lucrative to be a lawyer. I was about to say it. <laughs> yeah. <It's laughs> well, <laughs> From a visibility perspective, like they're they're like like the most popular followed accounts now because they're you know like uh, w impressively so like you know A16Z Paradigm you guys I mean th there's been a lot of hires 
um, and a big coordinated effort of going on the offense here. And, and I think it's really uh, encouraging to see that candidly. <laughs> I, I 100% agree. I, only thing I'd also add to that is like hats off to the blockchain association and all the work that they've been doing. Um, Coin Center as well. Like it's a lot of the same sentiment and, and principles that we as the industry have thought about and been pushing for years. And it's, it's I, I would say, really nice to see the recognition. Um, I, I would also add, and I haven't listened to the episode yet, but um, I would say this is definitely like, at least our take is, um, this is definitely really positive for the industry, like I said, but what I think the most positive outcome could be is that this just forces a, a more reasonable conversation from a, from a regulatory perspective, from, from a policy perspective. Um, and in lieu of just going down the regulatory path and it taking another couple of decades for us to settle all of these lawsuits and, and, you know, situations through the court system, um, so I, like, we're really hopeful that this lights a fire under policymakers to, to, you know, find something that works for the industry. Hey everyone, we've got a great episode here, but before we do, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to permissionless. This is the biggest and best conference in all of DeFi. It's the one that we do with bankless. Who's a great partner for us. Last year, we had almost 7,000 people there in West Palm beach. We are moving this year to Austin, Texas from September 11th through the 13th. And if you are a listener of bell curve, any of these last five seasons, this conference is basically custom made for you. We're going to be talking about liquid staking, the theme of this season. We've got a bunch of great panels on MEV. If you listen to the app chain thesis, we've got a bunch of Cosmos folks out there in full force. We're talking about the converging architecture of Solana, the roll-up space in ETH and Cosmos. So I would love to see all of you there. And to reward you for being such great listeners to Bell Curve, you get a special 30% off code. It's Bell Curve 30. That'll get you 30% off tickets. Click the link in the show notes and then head over to the permissionless site and make sure that you get your ticket today. Again, that is Bell Curve 30. Click the link in the show notes. Yeah. We got some breaking news coming in. Coindesk just got bought for 100, 125 million um, by uh, Matt Rozak and uh, Peter Vesnes. It was a, um, I don't know if you guys know Matt Rozak, but he's been putting t- this deal together for actually quite a while now um he's been kind of the leading there were a couple uh so backstory is dcg uh for those who don't know so dcg is the parent company of coindesk dcg owns a lot of kind of tier one assets in crypto or what used to be tier one assets coindesk uh grayscale genesis trade block um another another crypto company i'm forgetting the name of they obviously once everything blew up um specifically genesis needed some cash and they put Coindesk on the market uh, a couple of months ago. The There were a couple of kind of bigger bidders that came in, but I don't think Barry wanted to sell to some of those bigger bidders for like reputation reasons. And uh, Matt Rozak emerged as the leading bidder uh, about a month or two ago. Uh, Rozak is the founder of a crypto company called Block. He's the he's very like crypto OG. He, you know, if you look up, if you Google Matt Rozak, you'll see, you know, he gave Clinton, Bill Clinton, his first Bitcoin, Richard Branson, their first Bitcoins back in like 2013 or 2014. Mm-hmm. And then he also partnered with uh, Peter Bestness, who, um, if you guys remember the uh, the DAO hack from 2016, mm-hmm. uh, Peter Bestness was kind of the first one to identify that like, he was very early Bitcoin miner. Then he was, I think the first one to identify that there was this huge security vulnerability in, uh, in like in the DAO. Uh, he founded Coin Lab, which was the first venture backed Bitcoin company in 2012. Um, mm-hmm. they're, they're both just kind of like Bitcoin and crypto OGs. And so, uh, yeah, from one billionaire's hands to another, uh, Barry to, to Peter and That's Peter good. and Matt. Yeah. Uh, block, blocked with a Q. Yeah. I know that blocked company. Yeah. It was Atlanta based or something. Yeah, yeah. They're kind yeah, of an incubator of sorts for different. Yeah, yeah. 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 Never got much traction, I think, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so, That's looks good. like about a hundred. Well, 25. Well, yeah. Now. You know, now it's time to turn the pod uh, over, questioning over to you. What do you think? I think it's great. I'm very happy that this deal got done. I think that uh, I think that competition in media is a good thing, and that um, crypto as an industry has not had great journalism in the past, and that's one of the reasons that um, I mean, we we launched our news arm in January of 2021, and. Uh, I think that like having competition in journalism and in media is a really, really good thing. And so I'm happy that this deal went through and I'm happy that like Coindust didn't get killed. Nice. Speaking, my, of, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> well, at some, at some, we've talked about this before, but at some point, obviously, look, it's no surprise, both Framework and, I, and myself invested in the latest yeah. round along with 10T because uh, we're super excited about, I mean, we sit here every week and so it just made sense. Um, so now we got to we gotta interview both uh, you and Mike um, to just talk about the story of uh, Blockworks and stuff. So yeah, we'll exactly. Yeah, put the mics and then we'll do that soon. Speaking of but, another breaking news, transitioning a bit, uh, there was a, a big shakeup at Sequoia. I think they fired everyone that uh, the entire crypto team. We had Michelle. I think at some point uh, we interviewed. Was her Michelle out? Michelle's gone. Yes. Michelle's out. Yes. Uh, Michelle, and then uh, I think her more senior guy there, who was uh, no surprising, he left. It. left oh shit! Left Mike Moritz is out. Mike Moritz. Uh, Mike, Mike Moritz is out. Yeah. Uh, but but that, he, he's that, been on, well. He's technically uh, like out of the venture team, but he's transitioning to like yeah. their heritage, which is like their family office. Family office. Yeah. Yeah. He's not fired. No, but the, the other no. the, the it, relevant for this discussion, the crypto team is just out axed. Yeah. Um, oh, Dan, Dan Daniel sends out. Oh wow, Michelle. Yeah, holy shit, I missed this. <clears throat> yeah, the, well, I mean, the, they, they led FTX, and so I think that was a big egg in the face for them. Uh, yeah, I, I would say the bigger thing too is um, just the sentiment shift. It seems they are actively not going to be investing in crypto going forward. It seems. Yeah, that, that that's generally true. I mean, Sequoia has been funny enough. I was uh, at the time I was working at a venture fund called Sagey, and I went to Sequoia and I got pretty far in like because I wanted to join their team. And they they usually like their hiring process is really funky. They're just like come in and like pitch us some ideas. And literally, my memo was just buy crypto. Like it was Bitcoin. At some point, I'll probably publish it. <laughs> and this was like the last round, or it's one of the last rounds before meeting, like, uh, I guess, like, you know, Doug and a few of the other more senior guys. And this was the SaaS team. And they're like, I was like, guys, you invest in Dropbox. Like, you should invest in StoreJ. This was like before, before Filecoin. There's like StoreJ, like Block era, like made safe and stuff. Oh, so yeah. Just buy Bitcoin and stuff. And, and, and they're like, uh, they're like, you know what, man? Like, just, no, like we're not really interested in this. And then it was funny enough because I saw them years later, they were one of the early backers of Paradigm, right? I mean, Matt came from right. uh, Sequoia, right? And and they contributed, I think, in kind a bunch of Bitcoin at the low to Paradigm. Um, and, and then they did a few investments. But yeah, that's. Uh, I would say that the Sequoia shift is also happening in other major funds. I mean, of course, like Tiger... You have triple point. I mean, just a bunch of traditional funds. It came in late. Uh, maybe didn't, didn't dedicate enough resources. Um, have, uh, you know, moved uh, away from crypto in a very drastic way. Right. I mean, I think it's really just the crypto native firms that uh, remain. Um, both Vance and I, a couple months ago, went to one of our large LPs uh, annual meeting and um they run, I mean, a, a, a multi-strategy approach to all of their LP relationships. And you've got you know, private equity, growth equity, you've got traditional venture, you've got, and, th and then also crypto, and they have a dedicated blockchain um, venture fund as well. And it was it, walking out of that conference. I mean, there was an entire day dedicated to blockchain, blockchain GPs, um, and of which you know we we both presented on different panels. But it, it is very clear that there is such a stark difference between traditional venture and blockchain venture. And even they were saying it. It's just you know you could ask one of the traditional venture guys, "Hey, what do you think about blockchain technology? Where are we in the cycle?" And it's just you know you know fumbling over themselves to try and you know put some cogent argument together. And, you know, meanwhile, you've got an entire day dedicated to, to blockchain. I, I think what we're going to see is a, a really huge separation, even further than what we've had so far, um, where you look at it almost from like a, from, from the traditional guy's perspective, it's like, okay, we don't see any value in this. We don't understand it. Now we have an excuse. Like before the last two years, you really you, you didn't have an excuse from your LPs as to why you weren't doing it. Right. Now you have every excuse as to why you can't do it. Yeah. And, and I think that that, you know, as we continue down this path and, you know, we're starting to see the green shoots of what this next leg up and, and next kind of narrative will be what, with everything we're talking about with DeFi and all the narratives that, you know, everybody's excited about. But I, I think that they're just going to be even further left in the, in the back. Um, I, I think that's also kind of what happened with Sequoia's <laughs> over the last two years, they tried to play catch up real fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that happened at very tippy tops of the market cycle. And, you know, they got burned. Um, yeah. So now, now they're out. 
Yeah, I mean, like if if you're, I mean, surprisingly, and to give credit, A sixteen C is still here. Oh, and, absolutely. And they've they've opening a London office. They've hired another uh, you know person from the CFTC, I think, or a regulator. Like, look, so kudos to them, you know, because look. We all, there's always going to be a media story that says, uh, oh, look, they're marking down their portfolio drastically. And people don't really appreciate, one, how you mark up these positions, which is incredibly difficult in venture. Now, it's com- even to the nth degree because venture plus crypto is just a weird animal. Um, but they're still here, right? And, and, and I think uh, I really respect that because sometimes when, you're, when you have like a, a behemoth of an empire and crypto is one very small piece of it uh, that can have a lot of reputational damage. Uh, like Sequoia probably did the math and was like, we run so many other funds, super big funds. And like, why would we even consider like pissing off some of our LPs and like jeopardizing our position as a premier preeminent venture fund? Now, granted, they've done a lot of restructuring. Like they left China and then they left India and then they've left Brazil. So they're pretty, they've done a lot of restructuring over the years, I think. Um, which I think, and I don't want to read too much into this, but like, Michael, this is a point uh, that you perhaps were saying is, I mean, if you look at the returns of venture as an asset class and even hedge funds, but like just venture itself, like tier one, it's pretty, it's going through a pretty, pretty bad moment. I mean, it just historically returns have compressed pretty dramatically um, for a number of reasons. It's just more competitive. There's way more capital flowing into space. A lot of these guys like push the valuations to the extreme, uh, you know, paying like 20 times, 30 times forward ARR and just that, that combined with like companies not IPOing in 10 plus years, it makes it really difficult. Right. And so I think Michael, I'd be curious, you guys raised the fund, obviously what was, I think really good timing. And I think you have a lot of, uh, you know, cash to deploy. But like when you think about competition in crypto, like Polychain just raised another $200 million venture fund. So there's there's folks out there like Katie Hahn Ventures. I'm, I'm sure she hasn't called all the capital, but there's a decent amount of dry powder. Uh, but it feels like it's just back to crypto native funds. Um, mm-hmm. And so from a competition and return perspective, if the big, if, if the traditional venture guys are not showing up, like how are you thinking about just competition and investing in crypto when you go in and look at these rounds, you know, early stage, like how competitive is it now versus what it was like a year, two, three years, which just felt like, you know, things were just being bid up to. Yeah. Well, first thing I'll say is I think if you look at the long arc of venture um, performance has, even at the top, you know, uh, top quartile, top decile performance has definitely come down, but also I think is highly correlated with fund size going up. Um, and fund size really does dictate your business strategy. And when you have, you know, a billion dollars or multi-billion dollar funds, you have to return multiples of that, which means that, you know, your five, 10, 15, 20% ownership needs to be at levels that are tens of billions of dollars to be able to get, you know, a fund returning investment. And, and yeah, we, we definitely, I think, timed our last fundraise pretty well. I think it was about three weeks before Luna blew up is when we announced it. Um, and it was a 400, it, it is a $400 million vehicle. Um, we feel like we can be a, a very strong player at the seed in series A and, and a lot of those, um, and the fund size will help, you know, return many multiples of the fund. And, and that's kind of the strategy that you have to be playing for. If you're in the venture business and you want to be in the venture business long term, if you're in the asset management business, like maybe the Tigers of the world, where they're looking for an IRR return, um, it's just a, a different ballgame. And so seeing a lot of those players come out um, decreases the amount of valuation drift, as well as the level of competition um, in a lot of really positive ways, I think. you know, in, in some ways, you can get the intermediate marks of you did the seed round or the series A and then Tiger comes in and throws a $50 million check at your portfolio company. And you're like, oh, wow, I'm a genius. But in reality, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to return anything. It just means that somebody else has bought it for a higher value. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, you have to be sober in, in the ways that you think about what is real value and tangible value, which ultimately is returning multiples of the fund. Um, in regards to, you know, what's competition like these days, I think... Um, well, two things are going on. One, there's absolutely less competition. It's crypto natives basically only. There are a couple of upstart funds that are doing 
you know, on their first or second fund that are, you know, competing at the, you know, seed series A ish level. Um, I think frankly, it's going to be really hard for any fund that doesn't have distributions in the next fundraising cycle to be able to go and continue on polychain, you know, look at them, um, $200 million fund. I think their last fund was 700. So this is, this is definitely a step down from that. Um, I think they were also raising this at probably, you know, one of the most difficult times in the last decade to raise mm-hmm. a venture fund. So, and this is probably a first close and not a final close. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the landscape is changing quickly. Um, and I think the other thing that's going on, the second variable that's going on is there's just not as many people coming into the industry as you saw in 2021. So there's just not as many opportunities, but the quality of the opportunities that you are seeing is much higher. Mm-hmm. So that's probably more form fit for the industry that we have now of investors where you know it's crypto natives who understand this stuff, who can really dig in and help out from a crypto native perspective. And you're just not having to go chase things because, you know, the deal flow is 5x what you're seeing now. Um, So I think it's really positive for the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Now, like, of course, like some of the non-crypto native funds historically have just stuck to like deals like an FTX, right? Where they end up raising 50, 100 million. Like that's that's something they can easily do, right? They love these equity deals. What they haven't done historically, even at the peak of last cycle, which is doing on-chain stuff and really kind of yield farming and doing other strategies and just staking and like just holding ETH and staking and just being, which to me is where the real alpha like can be generated. Um, And so, you know, not every, even not some of the crypto native funds um, that are just purely kind of venture don't do this stuff, which is, I don't know, pretty, but it very, what I'm trying to say, very few funds uh, are active as you guys are on chain and, you know, you can do a number of things and how easy is it for, for a fund like you to, to convince your LPs that you're, you're able to do all these things, right? Cause they all want to either think you're either a, uh, I remember a pair of people always want to know, are you a hedge fund or are you a venture fund? And like, what is this bucket? Like, I just need to know which bucket I'm allocating from. And how do you, how do you kind of have that conversation with LPs? Yeah. The distinction that we think about is, are you an open-ended fund or are you closed-ended fund? And, and what that really means is, you know, do you have the ability to withdraw and manage everything in a liquid basis as you would with an open-ended fund? Or are you the kind of typical venture closed-ended 10-year vehicle? Um, we manage closed ended funds. So we consider ourselves to be, you know, venture thesis in the ways that we invest, where we're maniacally focused on ownership. Um, we want to be the the lead partner for whatever deal we're in. Um, you know, it's something where we want to have a long term relationship with anyone that we back. And and that mentality and that investment philosophy, I think, is the same philosophy as what you would see from a traditional venture partner uh, or traditional venture fund. Where we're different, to your point, is you know, you get access to, you know, according to the Ripple case, this new form of asset class called the digital asset earlier than you would with any other uh, venture investment where it's private equity. And being able to participate with that, use that asset, participate in governance, stake it, you know, help out the ecosystem, maybe run validator nodes, like whatever is necessary. I think that's not necessarily that hard of a sell from an LP perspective, because that's what these protocols need. And it's it's part of the part of the package that you get when you get an investment from framework is, you know, we're going to be participatory in any way we possibly can. Um, and and so I think that's becoming very common or commonly understood for from the LP world is like if you're not doing that, you're not really crypto native and you may be buying equity, but you also you know really think that the token is going to be worthwhile. Well, that's really kind of where the value will accrue. Um, so I, I think that's prob- probably the distinction that I would make between, you know, traditional and crypto native. Michael, what are the main questions that if you think about, um, you know, all of your port codes, maybe founders of your port codes, what are the main questions that they're coming to you with and what, what do they need advice on? Is it kind of tactical, like sales, marketing, or is it like more esoteric, like hiring and people management, or is it very crypto native, like launching tokens, token economics? It's literally all of the above. I think it really just depends on when. Um, 
you know, you make an investment into a seed stage company and they've got seven people working there and mm-hmm. they're like, how do we hire someone who can help us with X, Y, or Z? Or how do we find our head of research? It's like, okay, well, here's our recruiting partners and like, let's dig in. And, um, or it might be like, we're about to launch. How do we, you know, get in front of Blockworks or Coindesk or, you know, how do we get our messaging out or how do we craft our messaging? Like, okay, talk to Adam on our team. He's our comms partner and he's going to help you do that. And, um, yeah. I think once you launch, the things become more technical in nature to what we're talking about, where you're staking, you're providing governance assistance, you're running nodes. So like mm-hmm. earliest stages look and feel a lot like a typical um, startup where you're just helping with like the blocking and tackling of whatever you need to do. I'd say the other thing too is like, there's just a ton of, you know, co-founder, um, you know, discussions where you know, the other aspect here is, if you're successful in a traditional startup, you are you're gonna like try and absorb the world in in terms of power and influence and resources. Whereas if you're a founder of a protocol, you're turning over the keys to the kingdom in a few years. And that is a very fundamental shift from a founder philosophy perspective, where you're still gonna be pushing things, but it's gonna be governed by people who you may not even know. And you're still yeah. gonna be like, you still have the North Star. Or maybe somebody else takes up the reins and has the North Star in lieu of you. And that's kind of the goal. That transition, that different mentality, I think is a, is another just huge difference. Um, you know, I think about like Mark Zuckerberg versus like a Hayden or a Kane. Like they, they are fundamentally different in their philosophy on entrepreneurship. Um, and it just, it, it has to be for you to run a protocol versus a company. I'll tell you two things that uh, most recently have been top of mind. Like if I systematically look at like I get pinged by all my portfolio companies. It's like the two most frequent things that I'm getting pinged on is one, what does macro in the fundraising environment look like for a follow-on? Because I am running out of capital within three to nine months or 12 months. And what's your appetite to put more money and who else is out there giving like leading rounds? It's a very tough fundraising environment. Um, which brings us like people should go and listen to the discussions we recorded with Avichal and Haseeb, which the question is, would you rather invest in something new or do follow ons Some funds just don't do follow ons So I, I sometimes do do follow ons because if you can get out of the same valuation, reasonable valuation is much more de-risk. Like you just, you know, why wouldn't you, right? Um, so that's probably the most important one. Like there's a lot of, I think people are fairly nervous of what the fundraising environment is going to look like over the next year or two. And your ability to survive. Um, and the second one is um, like, help me get in front of these L2s that have big grant programs. Like they, a lot of times mm-hmm. is they want to understand where should we deploy, which gets us back to like the chain link thing is how important it is because it may not be today. It's super important. Oh, should I deploy an optimism or Arbitrum or Solana or Avalanche? What have you? Um or Polygon. And, and I think over time, that will be less of a relevant, I mean, it's still going to be an important decision, like where should you plant your flag first? But I think that will become less and less important over the next couple of years, as it just doesn't really matter where you deploy. Maybe it's just where whoever gives you the most amount of incentives, right? <laughs> or where the user... I think that's a great point, Santi. One thing that's very clear right now too is like wh- whatever L1 you choose to build on, you're kind of like that type of project. You know, like you're kind of that type of team and that type of app. Like if you are building on Solana, like that tells me a lot about your character and like who you are. If you build on Polygon, you are a very type different type of person than someone who goes and builds on Solana. I wonder if that changes. I mean, it, it, people talk about culture a lot. I mean, it's like in my mind, culture is something that's way overused and like not properly understood. It's like, uh, going back to like, I think it was Mike Moritz is his book or no, it's Ben Horitz. It's like culture is what you do, not what you say. And like, yeah. Okay. If you deploy in Solana, like I don't read too much into that candidly. Like I actually respect the Solana community a lot. It's going through something that the youth community went, uh, and not to, that we need to talk about it in this episode, but I've just talked to Ben, um, this week and, uh, I mean, as a result of Neon launching, and this is Neon's like an EVM um, kind of thing. So it basically allows you to like run an EVM and connect with Solana very easily. So again, more connectivity among chains is a, a key narrative and theme. 
Um, but yeah, the Solana community, I've seen some projects leave Solana and then have more success because they deployed in an L2 and Ethereum and an EVM chain. And But I, I don't think, um, if you were to think about how the pendulum has swung, Solana was all the rage when like, you know, like they had their conference uh, in Lisbon and two years in a row. And like, of course, the FTX kind of, um, you know, gravitas certainly helped it. But um, and now it's like it just swung in the totally opposite direction, which is like this is a dead protocol and it's not going anywhere. And it's just uh, um, but uh, look, the, the Saga phone is 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 really interesting. Um, I think the DeFi ecosystem there is, is you know, shows signs of resurgence. And so, you know, uh, the, the problem with crypto is people uh, once once you're scarred by something or like you have a to- say you held soul from like whatever it was at all time high. Now it's like down to nine and sold it. You don't want to ever like look at it. You're even like, you get annoyed if you look at the chart. And, and I think like sometimes like people just really shut themselves out to stop learning about what's happening there. And I, it's just a, I've done it. I've fallen in this trap before because it sucks to like constantly, like it's like salting your wounds. But, um, yeah, all this to say, I, th- I think we should have another episode talking about the, the Solana ecosystem and how these two worlds can converge. Because, you know, I, I know certain, a lot of people just have a very strong view on on not touching Solana and culturally and all this stuff. But uh, I'm more pragmatic, and I think there's very interesting innovation there. And and the team is, is hasn't given up. And I think that kind of stuff. I look to that as the most important thing. I mean, they they've actually taken a lot. And Anatoly, we've had him on the pot, and he said, listen. I actually welcome a lot of the criticism from the Ethereum community because that has allowed us to innovate, for instance, on, on the gas fee model and making it dynamic. And so, you know, I think um, it would be very different if you had someone like Anatoly, like not even entertain criticism and just turn a blind eye mm-hmm. or even sue people that are like an aunt on Twitter, which other <laughs> protocols are doing. But Solana is, is open. Like, I think that sort of ethos is also very much the Ethereum camp, which is it's so early. We're going to have to innovate over time. And if at some point we become rigid in our thinking, then someone else is going to innovate, out innovate us and out execute us. And so I respect that. Yeah. Well, one question, Sati, on that point, something that we talked about internally is, um, or for both of you guys, is just like, what do you think the overarching, overarching um, characteristic is that forces one decision to a chain versus another? Is it the technical? Is it the cultural? Is it the financial? Like, I think it depends. Personally, I think it depends on who the who the uh, the developer is and what they're what they're looking for. But um, it is interesting that all three of those can become the dominant factor, uh, depending. Yeah, I would say um, it it depends on the type of protocol, um, like gaming versus uh, just DeFi. Yeah, uh, historically, it's probably like. Well, in the days of FTX and whatnot, like it was a lot of DeFi protocols like were deploying on Solana because it was like, uh, a, uh, what is the language that they use? Uh, Rust, right? Yeah. A lot of like, you saw new developers that were not like Solidity coders just join the industry because they're really excited. You know, you, you heard the narrative and the Solana is back to like FTX and Jane Street and all, the, all that stuff kind of like, matter today is different i think um candidly most people just deploy on ethereum because that's where most of the activity is most of the users are like there's just a lot of excitement in l2s base um you know which we haven't really seen the full extent of that but they're they just kind of was it this week that just came out with like uh i was about to say that's the other announcement out of ecc or same timing at least is uh you know based has base i think is available for dev net yeah so that's that catch. I, I think when when you see that, when you have base, when you have arbitrage, when you have optimism, and all, there's just so much innovation happening there that, candidly, nine out of ten just look at that and developers and say, "We want to be here because this is where the it's buzzing." Right? There's just so much right. innovation today. Right. The cultural side. Yeah, 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 and the users too. I mean, that's where like most of the activity yeah. is. Right. It's just a combination of things. There have been two things that like in conversations with developers, two main things that I feel like people want. One is uh, longevity. So you want to be able to build something. If you build on a protocol, you want that protocol to be around in five, 10 years from now. 
So that's one thing. Like uh, one of the big questions I think when people are debating building on Arbitrum versus Solana is, is Arbitrum going to be here in five years? Is Solana going to be here in five years? Is, are these ecosystems that are supported and have longevity and have Lindy? The, and then the next thing is um, uh, customizability, right? I think that was the frust pre some of these L2s. Like that was one of the frustrating things with maybe building on ETH L1 is like, if you were a developer, it feels like some of these key decisions about how you should build your protocol or your exchange or your wallet, it feels like some of them have, had already been made for you. Whereas if you built in something like Solana, there was more of like an open playground to play in. Um, I think that'll probably change um, as you get more like customizability with some like the OP stack and things like that. But I think that, yeah, that was something else. And then I think the third bucket is simplicity, right? Like if you build on, again, pre like OP stack and Arbitrum and things like that, it was um, very complex to build on ETH, right? It was very, very complex. Yep. Whereas building, building on something like Solana was, I mean, even though Rust is a very difficult programming language, it was just easier to, to, to get started and to hit the ground running. I think that uh, changes the base and uh, OP stack and Arbitrum. I mean, Michael, uh, turn around. Um, two questions, maybe. One, have you ever looked at an investment and learn that the founder is very much gun ho in deploying in a protocol that you didn't have as much of an interest in, not just Solana, it could be Definity, Avalanche, whatever. Did that like tick you off to not make the investment because you read too much in it, the quality and the caliber of the founder? And two, of your entire portfolio, what percentage is Ethereum centric? Hmm. Well, the first question, 100%. And not to say that like that is the only factor, but I think to your point, it, it does give you some understanding of the psychology of the founding team. Um, and so if it's already sort of a question of it, are they crypto native, are they you know really understanding the trade-offs here, and then you go and choose uh, you know out there you know not very widely used protocol then or blockchain, then absolutely it just furthers the point. But it, I wouldn't say that we've had anything where. I would say the one thing that we also do is like, or have seen is a number of like, we're building this on that blockchain, which frankly, I think that just never really works and historically hasn't you know been a, a, a real valuable asset. Um, the second question, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I think probably if I'm really thinking about it, probably like two thirds Ethereum, one third, uh, or maybe like 75% Ethereum, 25% Solana. Um, and yeah, I'd say historically that's been like almost a hundred percent Ethereum and, and it's definitely changing over time. I would say there's also in respect to like games, you know, those don't, necessarily have uh, as much of a blockchain interaction as you would necessarily need because you know, ideally the usage is just have like that's where I think an example of the technology is the overriding factor and not necessarily the cultural side because games have this intention of being net new users or at least I think the really good games mm -hmm. have an intention of like we don't we're not going after like the the web3 natives as like our core customer base we're going to hopefully attract some of them but blockchain is really what enables our ownership economy in this game ecosystem. It's not something where we need the liquidity, the assets, everything that you would see with a DeFi protocol, for instance. So games are a little bit different and, and definitely have seen more games on Solana. Um, so that's yeah. that's where that you know one third, one half, one quarter comes from. Yeah, I would, that's a, such a good point because some, some of my investments, like super early stages, are agnostic. They're like, we just don't know. We'll make that decision right. down the road when we are ready to pick a partner, but for now we're just going to go deep and build the gameplay and the lore and all this stuff. Um, but yeah, some of them are even considering launching their own L1, like, <laughs> which is, is going to be, we've talked about this narrative uh, emerging over time, but you're going to see more and more of that. I think just protocols, particularly games wanting to own uh, the entire stack to, uh, you know, so but the especially, that, especially if you have the connectivity fiber, like like with the CCIP or layer zero, just bring it back to that, then it just the fact that we're discussing this, like we're probably going to look at this and laugh. It was like, how relevant was this discussion? You know, certainly from security, it does make sense, which is why I've decided for something like DeFi, I think it matters a lot. And, and you read into why Visa, for instance, chose Ethereum. Like we go back to this. 
I'm not going to read like so much into that, but I think security begets liquidity, which improves security. And, and that virtuous cycle is what has made Ethereum DeFi just, just the most battle tested. And, um, and when you're, you need, a, you need the Lindy of, of Ethereum, um, to just feel comfortable transacting in, in, a, in a DeFi environment, right? If you're a game, then it, I understand like you're, you're a consumer application where you can loosen some of these constraints, but with DeFi, I think uh, for me, it's just, it's hard to, to make investments like Solana. Yeah. But like, uh, even then, like, I think just Ethereum is just so far in a way just proven and battle tested that it just makes the case for the, the interaction that you have, the composability that you get. I mean, the, all those things just do matter a lot. Right. One, one additional fact, and, and actually, you know, now that I think about it, there, there's definitely applications that we've invested in that haven't launched yet. I would say that the way that that percentage will change is that Avalanche will be kind of the third. Um, and in a lot of ways, um, the way that those uh, applications in particular will interact is that they're by default going to be multi-chain just for different aspects of the application, where like a matching engine or something that's more computationally intensive is going to live on the Avalanche platform, but the actual assets themselves will live on Ethereum. And frankly, a lot of those are also reliant upon um, the eventual launch of CCIP and have been for the last two years. So like that's another case in point for why you know CCIP becomes powerful is because you don't necessarily have to just be wedded. A single application doesn't have to be wedded to a single blockchain. Um, if you know the, the vision of layer zero or CCIP is realized, where you can have the user experience on one chain and you know you can leverage other abilities, technical abilities or or cultural abilities of a blockchain to do other aspects of it. Yeah. What else is on the block, Yano, to talk about? I mean, there's just a couple of announcements I mean, the, in there, but the last the last thing I found interesting, I mean, very related to this conversation was uh Cello. So Cello is an L1, and they announced that they were um Proposal to convert into an Ethereum L2. Yeah, proposal to convert into an Ethereum L2, which is I think um I think a pretty interesting strategy that I think is you'll probably see more of, right? I think whether there's a bunch of different reasons to do it, but I think at the end of the day, like you talk to some of these L1s and they 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 come to realize that securing a network of nodes is really freaking hard and capital intensive and time consuming and just not worth the mental bandwidth to focus on. So instead, like they're turning to Ethereum, right? Which is like Santi, you mentioned, like the most Lindy and the most robust option. And it offers Ethereum is basically becoming like security as a service for all of these, for them to post call data and to settle value to. And I think, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for Cello. Um, Look, yeah. I mean, I still remember having a lot of these discussions and when you saw the, the L1 kind of crop up like popcorn. And it was just one of those things where it, it felt like the incentives were there. And I understand to go and launch your L1, competing L1. It was just, it, it just is there. Like, uh, and it, we talk about incentives a lot in crypto, but like if you're a developer, there's a lot of big incentives to just launch your L1. Just the nature of the game. And Ethereum for a while, it, it really sucked to see that because you're like all this brain power and it's distracting, but you sort of take it, look, it's open competition, it's open source. Like it's just, you got to let it run its course. And eventually I think you're coming back to this realization where projects realize like, yeah, it's really tough. Like there's crickets and all these L1s. And so any chance of getting remote activity is just to bring, come back to Ethereum. Um, so it's just sort of, um, but for a while it just felt like, you know, everyone and their mother was launching an L1 because it was like, you know, just more financially lucrative to do that than work at the Ethereum foundation. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it is what it is, right? I mean, I'm just going to call it as I see it. Like it, it just made sense. If you're not to pick on any particular competing L1, but yeah. Do you think that that'll continue with an equivalent popcorn of L2s? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Big time. I, I literally, uh, every week I get pitched another L2, uh, which is not a bad thing. I mean, like, look, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in free markets and open competition and, I think it sucks from the perspective of uh, entrepreneur because a lot of times it just 
fork and do your stuff. But look, the OP stack, I think they're pretty open from a philosophical standpoint. I mean, it's like, okay, like, you know, I, I respect that. And I think, um, you just sort of welcome ruthless competition. Um, now maybe question to you, Michael is like, are you, does that bother you that there's like a world where there's like hundreds of L2s? Does it even matter if you have good connectivity between them? Well, I, I think what you're assuming is that you're completing on you're competing on the same plane uh, with every other L2, which would be an execution environment. Whereas I think that there's an element of if you have a differentiated product or service, an L2 strategy is really just becoming your new business strategy. And and so I, I think if we're talking about execution environments, it's gonna be really hard to displace the existing incumbents unless you have an existing or differentiated or existing user base or differentiated edge. What I do think is the case is, you know, you've got a truly differentiated product or service. And instead of building this as a smart contract platform on top of an, an execution environment, it may make sense to have your own L2, maybe not your own L1. And that, you know, middle of the stack is probably a better fit. But uh, so that, yeah, I'd say, you know, L2 as a business strategy for things that are differentiated is probably where we would gravitate towards. But if it's just going to be the same plane of competition, it's going to be tough. But let, let me ask you a question because I'm not as technically well versed to think about this, but I, I'll ask the question because and then I'll think about it. But it's sort of what are the design choices that allow like if you're launching your L2, say that you're a, a game, right? Or a whatever. Uh DYDX before it went to Cosmos. Like if you want to launch your L2, like why, what's the trade-off from a founder's perspective saying, I'm going to deploy an Arbitrum versus no, I want to launch my own like fork of optimism. Like what are the, like what's the benefit of launching your own L2 versus deploying on Arbitrum or optimism or base? Well, you have to recruit so I, a validator set, right? Uh, yep. to think about decentralizing the sequencer, but like, yeah, look, there's Espresso and a bunch of other things folks that you can partner with me but it's it's more of a technical like you then have to from an internal team resource perspective you have to expend energy in thinking about all of that versus just focusing on your core product and competency to totally um i think what you enable are a couple of things yes it's it's much more heavy heavy lifting you have to be able to build the technology and the infrastructure to where you're supporting not only just an application set but a validator set to secure and manage that entire ecosystem what you get to control is a lot of the economy of that digital asset um, which i think has a lot of really strong elements especially when it comes to infrastructure services so computational services i think is a prime example of this if you're building sort of an application i don't think it necessarily makes sense for you to to be your own l2 now for instance if you're you know a game and you've got three or four different games and you've got a bunch of technology that's underpinning that game that's native to the game ecosystem maybe it does make sense but so i would say being able to control the economy being able to control the the technology um, it comes with pros and cons, but I would say that's probably the biggest architectural difference. Um, you just have to have a justifiable reason why you need to control those aspects. Otherwise, it just feels like you're launching an L2 to, to have a token. Yeah, that's a good point. Jens, good chat. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah, M Michael. Uh, well, a question: Any of you guys uh, have managed or have are going to see Oppenheimer or Barbie, and in what order? I've got uh, back to back. <laughs> oh, same day. <laughs> same day. Uh, <laughs> my my uh, my girlfriend has a has a knack for falling asleep in movies, so we're going to go see Oppenheimer at like ten thirty in the morning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Barbie after that. Is that is that a bear market thing? Because I heard tickets before noon are cheaper, man. Like, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> gotta save, gotta save where you can. Yeah, I, I love it, man. This she talking? I love this philosophy. Okay, so Oppenheimer in the morning, and then Barbie yeah. in the afternoon. I mean, listen, I think Rotten Tomatoes you'll be, came out. You'll be attending solo. You'll be going to another movie alone. I'm assuming, dude. Like, <laughs> impossible. But sure, you think <laughs> you, you that. Um, 
It's going to be good. I think Oppenheimer got 96 on Rotten Tomatoes and Barbie has 93%. So Hollywood is back. I got to say there was like two years during COVID where you needed it the most. There was like no good movies. Now Mission, Mission Impossible is pretty good. Like, you know, I, I liked it. And some, some good I hate to break it to you, Santi, but it always has like a one to two year time lag. But we're about to hit another dead spot with this uh, with the oh. strike. Well, ho- the red- hopefully by then crypto will deliver its <laughs> value, so we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. <laughs> we got all of our dopamine from the markets in 2014 and 2015, so we'll be good. Uh, yeah. By then the FTX movie will come out. You know, it's like. Oh man! Well, that's the other thing. Did you know that Michael Lewis is set to launch his book uh, two days before the FTX uh, uh, SBF yeah. uh, trial is supposed to begin? Oh, oh really? Yeah, genius. genius. Wow. Bradley Dale um, launched his his book. I I, I got yep. it. I haven't gotten to it, but uh, yeah, that's that's gonna be exciting. And that was a crazy quick turnaround for that book. I was like, I, that, like I was like, uh, he must have been working on some background information. I mean, he was traveling with him, I know, and but he must have been writing yeah. simultaneously. But to get a book published in like nine months is. I didn't he, think that was probably possible. probably changed the title of the book and the theme. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably at the content. It's like, oh, wait a minute. We got to change oh, in this to 180. Yeah. The last last yeah. couple chapters are new. Yeah, just last, last yeah, couple chapters yeah. amended. Uh, yeah. Guys, great discussion. Yano, is great this good advice for Roundup? <laughs> you guys did well. Nice, nice <laughs> one. All right. All right. Thanks for listening, folks. See you guys next week.